brought to you by Head Start Basketball. If you don't have a good youth program, you don't have a good high school program is how I kind of look at it. It's really important to me that these younger kids know who I am and know what I'm about and make sure they're having fun first off, because if you're not having fun, then why are you there? Brittany McNamara is the head girls basketball coach at Midview High School in the state of Ohio. She took over the Midview program in 2021 and led the Middies to the state final four in 2023. Brittany previously served as the head coach at Berea Mid Park High School for two seasons. Prior to her first head coaching job with the Titans, McNamara was a varsity assistant coach for four seasons at Trinity High School. She began her coaching career as the junior varsity coach with Mayfield High School in 2014. McNamara is also active on the AAU circuit where her father, Kevin, runs the successful AAU program Mac Basketball in Northeast Ohio. Brittany was a two-time All-Ohio standout and the 2013 Lorain County Player of the Year while a student at Elyria Catholic High School in Ohio. The Panthers basketball team made it to the Ohio Final Four during her sophomore year. She's the all-time leader at Elyria Catholic in three-pointers made in a season, in a career, and in a game. Hey, Hoophead, save $3,500 on the Dr. Dish CT Plus and score free custom graphics during Dr. Dish Basketball's Push Beyond sales event. Shop this exclusive offer now until March 31st while supplies last. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Those are some great deals, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Munch Williams from Pro Scholar Athletics and the author of Our PSA. And you're listening to the Hoop Heads podcast. Pro Skills Basketball is the nation's premier club basketball organization, building a European style youth basketball academy, and is looking for the top basketball leaders in major U.S. cities to become our next city directors. Specifically, Pro Skills is looking for women and men of high character and grit who see the problems in youth basketball and want to join an elite team focused on a singular mission to change the culture of youth basketball. This job typically begins as a part-time position with the desire and expectation from both the city director and pro skills that together they will build it up to eventually support a full-time city director position. If you're interested in learning more or applying, please visit proskillsbasketball.com slash jobs. Prepare like the pros with the all-new FastDraw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off FastDraw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improve communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Be sure to grab pen and paper before you listen to this episode with Brittany McNamara, head girls basketball coach at Midview High School in the state of Ohio. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sokol tonight. And we are pleased to welcome the head girls basketball coach at Midview High School here in the state of Ohio, Brittany McNamara. Brittany, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We are excited to have you on. Looking forward to diving into all of the things that you've been able to do throughout your basketball life. Let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. Tell me about some of your earliest memories of the game of basketball. You know, I remember, um, you know, a lot of, you know, having like the little tykes ball in my hand at all times, you know, doing all the little stuff. Um, the funniest part about me going back to in the time I think about, you know, my dad, obviously, is a huge, huge person in my life that um, has really pushed me into this game of basketball that I love. Um, but at first, he didn't really want me to be. 
the basketball <laughs> player or the tomboy per se. He kind of wanted me to be his little princess. So I did a uh, competitive cheerleading for a really long time. Oh boy. And it kind of, you know, was a, you know, breaking point in elementary where, you know, it was either they wanted me to be like their cheerleader or, you know, I had to play all the other sports that I wanted to play. And I chose, you know, basketball and softball and volleyball and all that over cheerleading. So I might have broken my dad's heart a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> I probably, tur- probably turned it probably turned out okay. I'm sure he, I'm sure he'd rather go to your basketball games than no, go, to, go, to dan- go to dance recitals and all that stuff. Oh, Ooh, yeah, I would, man, you know, I would rather go to a basketball game now. Ten so times I, over. A- I have two daughters, Brittany. So I have one who's a sophomore in college and then I have another daughter who's uh, going to be a well, she's in eighth grade now, so she'll be a freshman next year. Oh, and wow. my older one never did any dance at all, never any interest, you know, nothing. And then my younger one, she did like, I don't know, maybe like four months of <laughs> dance. And then she was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. This is probably when she was like six, seven. I'm like, yes, let's move on and get, <laughs> move let's in. Go, let's, yeah, let's go do, let's go do something else. So I can, so I can completely relate. Talk a little bit about once you did decide on basketball. Talk about the influence of your dad and just kind of how he impacted who you became as a player. Yeah, my dad means everything to me, you know, not just in, in the basketball world, but in life, obviously. And he really started out, um, you know, he realized that my love of basketball was just as big as his. And he wanted to find, um, you know, a travel league for me to play in, to play with, you know, better competition. You know, all the girls that are like minded, um, like me around myself and so that's when um, he started the girls' side over at TNBA, and we really started going. And it was something that, you know, I just got to meet all these other girls around the area and really just fell in love more and more and more with the game of basketball. And um, we grew up in Avon, so Avon obviously has a really rich history of, you know, having great sports and all that stuff surrounding them. And at the time, it was just starting to come up. Like, I remember having – um cornfields in our backyard in, in, in Avon. <laughs> yeah. Who would think that Avon hey, would have cornfields? Hey, Strong, Strongsville, the mall in Strongsville. Jason may not even remember. The mall in Strongsville was, that was a cornfield when I was a kid. So, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah I, so, long time ago. I'm a lot older than you. Hey, hey, yeah, I do know that, Mike. Do you know what they originally were talking about putting in Strongsville? Do you know this? The Brown Stadium. No, no, the Cab Stadium. They were talking about putting the Cab oh, Stadium when they were relocating. When they were recloading, they were trying to get it. They didn't want to get the. Uh, they didn't want to get too close. They did. You know, Richfield was too far away. But they were thinking of not going all the way into Cleveland, Mike. I, boy, I'm pretty would, sure boy, would that would, st- boy would that have been dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I love going to the Coliseum, but obviously, moving it into the city was the right decision. Yeah. And if you thought if they'd have come halfway and put it in Strongsville, man, that would have been. That would have been no, the Brown Stadium is going to be at Bria yeah, or Brook, Brook Park, Park, right, Mike? Brook Park. <laughs> give, give, give me a break. The That's Brook nice. Park That's Brown. That's right. That's it. There we go. That's interesting. All right. So tell me a little bit about what the travel basketball AAU situation was like for you as you're starting to get into it. Because obviously now we know where it is and how it's exploded yeah. and everybody's playing. But what do you remember about it at that time? especially on the girls' side. Yeah, you know, it wasn't as it is now, for sure. Um, You know, there was these big tournaments here and there, but that's all that there really was, like one or two big tournaments. Um, And then everything else was really local. We kind of played the same people all the time, um, just because it wasn't as big. And, you know, it it, it was kind of fun because you got those rivalries, you know, that you had in, in like, school basketball with AAU basketball. But, um. Yeah, as I've seen the game grow and grow over, you know, my time of playing and now coaching, it's it's just been crazy to watch and crazy to be a part of just to see how girls basketball has just kind of exploded over the past couple of years. Yeah, how do you see the opportunity? I think this is something that again, I go back to my time as a player. So now we're going back 30 some odd years and I just think that the opportunity for girls to be able to play basketball Back when I was playing, there was no travel basketball. There was no AAU basketball. Basically, you had rec basketball. And then at that time, there was a lot of pickup basketball on the guys' side. But if you're a female and you wanted to be able to try to play pickup basketball, good luck trying to find a game of all females (laughs) and good luck trying to get into a game with 
a bunch of guys depending upon where it is that you're going to go. So just maybe talk in general a little bit about what you see as a female head coach, just in terms of the opportunity that girls in general have in the game compared to 10 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever perspective you want to take on that. Yeah, you know, it was it was actually um, pretty hard for me to get my first coaching job. Um, I, n- not just because of my age, I kind of went into it really young. I um, interviewed for my first coaching job over at Bay High School um, when I was 23. So, and I was probably one of the only females that were going up for, um, for that job at that time. Um, and so one, it was hard because I was a female with no experience, um, as a head coach, I was my dad's assistant coach for a few years prior before that. But, you know, just from then to now, uh, it's just been so great to see, you know, the love and support that girls basketball gets you know, not just at the collegiate level and the professional level, but, you know, even at the high school level. Um, I get along really well with our boys head coach, Jim Brabenick. And I think it's, you know, just because of great people now that just want to keep supporting each other. And, you know, we have so many, so many great um, people in our lives, like at Mac basketball, where the men that are coaching these women or these young women are really trying to push that aspect of you can do anything that you know, a boy can do, you can do anything that, you know, whatever you put your mind to, you can do it. Um, and giving these girls those, that confidence that I believe that all girls, all females, all athletes really should have that, that mindset of, I can really do anything I put my mind to if I work hard enough at it. As you were coming up through (laughs) high school and college was, and obviously with your dad's coaching background was coaching something that was in the forefront of your mind that, Hey, when I graduate, I want to get into coaching or was it more something that happened as you got closer to the point where you had to make a career decision or were you always thinking about being a coach? I think I was always thinking about being a coach. Um, I don't think my necessarily how it panned out was always what I thought it was going to be. the, The plan didn't necessarily follow the script. huh? Yes. Um, you know, I always wanted to be a coach, you know, just because one, my dad has always been my coach and that always wasn't the easiest. <laughs> we sure. definitely butted heads. We definitely yelled at each other, you know, did the, the, did, you know, what, you know, a daughter and father would do when they're competitive and stubborn as we are. Um, but yeah, it just didn't fit the script of what I was planning with my life as, you know, getting to being a coach at some point in time. I knew it no matter what, going into college my first year, I was doing education so I could be in the schools to coach. Um, but yeah, it just didn't end up like that. But I always, yeah, I always thought that at some point I would end up back with the game of basketball, you know, coaching, you know, helping girls, you know, love it just as much as I did. All right. So talk us through, if it didn't go according to script, maybe what did you envision happen, happen <laughs> happening? And then what exactly did happen? I envisioned playing all four years and, you know, getting that degree and, you know, kind of being a graduate assistant at the school I was at or getting a graduate assistant job somewhere else. And then, you know, if that took me, you know, to a college job, then it took me to a college job. I really never thought of coaching high school. I always thought it was going to be, you know, at the college level doing the things that, you know, I've always, you know, dreamed of doing. But um, after my first year, I decided to come home. I went to Chestnut Hill College out in Philadelphia, which I loved. It was this small town. Um, they have like a Harry Potter weekend. It, the ca- the school looked like it was a castle out of Harry Potter. It, it was nice. crazy. And they really, you know, dove into that. But You're was- speaking Mike's language. He loved <laughs> Harry Potter. Oh, it's his favorite show. Don't start listening. Off, don't start listing off to all those characters. I might fall asleep. He, over he, he can't. He can't stand Harry Potter, or Brittany. But I'm too, a huge Harry Potter too, fan, many, so. too many. If, if you guys want to step talk Harry Potter, I can step out for a few minutes. You guys can. <laughs> we could do a little Harry Potter interlude, and I can come back in. Oh, that's uh, so funny. <laughs> but yeah, so they just like they did all that stuff, and it was like really a cute little small town in Philly. Um, and that whole city was so great to be around for that year. But basketball wise, it didn't um, pan out the way I wanted to. The coach sold me a dream pretty much. And at the end of it, I just hated basketball. Did not, to my love was taken away from the game and I didn't want anything to do with it. 
So when I came home, I told my dad I was done. I was like, I'm not playing. I'm not transferring anywhere. I'm done. I'm just going to go to school, blah, blah. Well, he goes, well, you're not done. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> laughed. I go, no, I'm done. And he goes, no, you're going to help me out. Because you're not just going to come home and stop doing basketball. And I'm like, whatever. You know, like the right. typical teenage yeah, for whatever. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and so I started coaching with him. And, you know, I realized that, you know, my whole thing is I'm never going to want a girl to leave, you know, my program, my team, anything, hating basketball. Changing their mind that, you know, this was the worst decision they could have made playing. You know, so... I wanted to take what my coach did to me in in college and reverse that and make sure that nobody ever left my program feeling less than, um, feeling like they couldn't do it, feeling like they weren't appreciated um, ever. So my dad brought that love back into my heart for the game, and I was able to start coaching with him at Mayfield. And then, you know, we moved to Trinity, and I got to meet some pretty great girls, and I had a couple of um, head coaching interviews and nobody would want me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty hard. And then um, then I got the chance to go to Berea Mid Park, which was pretty cool. So um, just being able to change that narrative of, you know, some girls that never wanted to play, never thought they'd pick up the basketball to be the person that, you know, changes their mind about loving something that's so fun in my mind um, is pretty special. All right. So let me ask you about this. I think one of the things that's always a challenge, right, as a coach is that you have your players that play a lot, which is obviously mm -hmm. what players want, and nobody ever gets enough minutes or enough shots. So yeah. the players who are playing a lot, they tend to be happy. They tend to have positive <laughs> attitudes. And occasionally you get somebody who isn't playing as much as they might think they should, or they're not getting enough minutes. And, and those are the kids sometimes that it's difficult to maintain that love for the game of basketball, like you talked about. And yet I think when you look around the landscape of coaching, right, the best coaches are the ones who, yeah, they win a lot of games and yeah, they have a ton of success, but they also develop a program where player 12, even though they may not be getting the minutes that they would love to get, they still love being a part of that team, that program. And the good coaches do it well by building that relationship and making sure that that kid feels valued and all those types of things. So how do you approach that end of it where you're building that entire program where every kid who, who touches your team is valued and feels the way you described that you want those kids to love the game of basketball. You want it to be a positive experience for them. You don't want them to come home from their experience. Like you came home from Chestnut Hill feeling like, mm -hmm. man, the basketball got it got taken away from me. So how do you do that? Yeah, you know, it's it's a hard thing because every person, um, every kid is different. Um, but I, I try to create that personal relationship with the kids in my program. Um, last year, for an, for an example, we had um, seven seniors and really only four of them got to play big minutes or, you know, really the minutes at all. Um, and so I had a few of them sitting in the rear, you know, not really playing, but, you know, I try to be open, like an open book, open communication, um, trying to tell them from the get go, like, you probably won't get a lot of time, you know, but we're going to have a lot of fun. And if you're starting to not have fun, you need to let me know so I can make sure that you're included. You, you feel special. You feel part of it. You know, it's finding those little moments, you know, in practice or, you know, during a game or, you know, even during the day or a team bonding that you can really take those kids and, you know, put them on the pedestal. Like we put all like the kids that score the thousand points or, you know, that make the game winning shot, you know, put them on that pedestal that they, you know, want to be at, but in a different light. And, you know, I tried to be able to, I tried to do that, you know, with all my girls, no matter if they're going to play or not. Um, sometimes I have my slip ups. Everybody does. Um, <laughs> you know, in the moments or stuff like that. But in the end of the day, like I had, I had a girl that never touched the floor, not once last year. And, you know, she just called me like two days ago, telling me how sh she loves Cincinnati. It's like the greatest thing in the world. She's having a great time just checking up on me. You know, it, it, it's those things that, you know, that's more special to me than the wins and the, yeah. you know, than 
trophies, the nets, anything, just to be able to have, you know, those girls be able to call you later on in life and be like, Hey coach, what's up? How are you doing? I've been thinking about you lately. Um, you know, it's finding those special moments in time where you can put them on that pedestal. I think that those other kids um, get to be on all the time. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, it's making that investment in them as a person and not Mm -hmm. just as a basketball player. And I think when you do that, then you get to have those phone calls and there, there's very few things in life. If you're a coach that are more satisfying than that phone call that you just described of somebody calling you up that, and just saying, Hey, here's what's going on in my life. And I want to share it with you because you were such a big influence on me and, and who I am. And I think that anybody who coaches knows how special those, those phone calls are. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about your time working for your dad as an assistant. Let's start with what do you think has been his biggest influence on you as a coach? In other words, when you think about who you are as a coach, what are one or two things that you feel like you've taken from him that you've incorporated into your coaching style? Um, so one of the things that popped right into my mind is um, at the beginning of every season, you know, ever since I was little, he would tell every team that he coached, my team, whoever, whatever team it was, my job is to love you. Your job is to love each other. And I really have resonated with that my entire life. You know, and I take it and I say it to every team that I coach at the beginning of the year, to let them know that that's my job of the season and what their job is for the season. Because if we can do that, we can be really successful. And, you know, it's really shown over the years, you know, if you if you show these kids that you love them and respect them and they love and respect each other, you know, good things are going to happen. Great things are going to happen to us. We're going to get those wins. We're going to, you know, at the buzzer, those kind of things, because we, we really care about each other. So taking that from him has been huge for me because I think um, at the end of the day, most teams are families and just to have start that off in a family positive atmosphere, I think is huge. Um, Just to, you know, tell them from the get go that my job is to love you Um, to show that these kids are loved, to show them that you will love them no matter what um, is huge to them. (laughs) No question (laughs) about that. You know, you're good. Yeah. I, I think that's I think that's spot on. And again, when you can build that right from the get go, and, and it's something that you put out there right away, and then you live it, then everybody gets to feel that. And again, that that shows that everyone in the program can be valued. And like I said, I, I think that that that's a lot easier to say mm-hmm. than it is to do. And so you really have to be intentional about how you go about doing that. And obviously that's something great that you learned from your dad and your time with him. Mm -hmm. When you're working with your dad and you talked a little bit about it as button heads a little bit when you're (laughs) player player coach. So how about one of the things that's always interesting, right? Is assistant coaches, sometimes your job is to say, Hey, are we really doing this right? And obviously eventually you have to come to a consensus in the coach's office and walk out and everybody's on the same page. What was the most challenging aspect of of being your dad's assistant in terms of just obviously the relationship that you have, father, daughter, but then head coach, assistant coach, that relationship is different. It's a business, it's a business relationship. So just talk a little bit about maybe what was the most challenging aspect of working for your dad? Yeah, I guess it would be um we're both very vocal <laughs> and we're both kind of set in our ways type of people. And I, I think I got that from him. My mom likes to you know, rub that in my dad's face when I'm being (laughs) stubborn (laughs) towards him. And, um, but you know, when, when I started to really come into my own as a coach after, you know, a couple of years, you know, learning from him and under underneath him as an assistant coach, I've developed my own coaching style and what I think I would do in situations. And I think it would be hard for me to watch him, you know, put a play together or, you know, say we're going to run this and, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I don't think that's going to work. Or, I, well, I would think I would do this better, you know, and I'd say something and he'd be like, no, uh, no, it's not going to work. Or he'd say however he would, cause he's stubborn, just like me. Um, and then I'd get mad about it. And then we'd have to drive home together. Nice. <laughs> sit in a nice. Car. nice. And so we'd have to, t- we, it would have to come out. Um, but I think that was really hard. And then also when I started coaching AAU and having my own team, um, the hardest part would be 
myself coaching and then he comes into the huddle and says the same exact thing I say. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I, well, I just said I just that. Said but that. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, so I think funny. those are hard things because it's like the control factor, I would say. Um, you know, every coach likes to have control of their own, you know, team. And for sure, when you've got two big models like ours. Um, <laughs> it's hard to, you know, step back and say, oh, okay, maybe he's right. All right. You mentioned going on a couple of interviews for head coaching jobs and mm -hmm. not, not getting those jobs initially. And when you think back to that time, as you're working to try to, to get your first head coaching job, what do you think were, or, or what were some of the questions in the interviews that you remember that you thought, oh man, like that one, that one maybe jumped up and got me like I wasn't thinking about that or, or, or just where were you in terms of, of feeling prepared for a head coaching job at the time when you first started interviewing? Um, so my first interview with Bay High School, I think was kind of, I went into it like, oh, what? preparing a little bit, but not as enough, not as enough as I should have, Right, I should say, because yep. you're like going into, you're like, oh, we're just going to talk about basketball, you know? You don't really see the behind the scenes as a player with the boosters and fundraising sure. and yep. the money aspect of it all. Or, you know, they ask you the parent question, like, how do you deal with this situation that a parent comes up to you with? Um, so I think, you know, my first interview with Bay, that that is something that really stumped me a couple, you know, the first couple of times they asked me, it was like, oh, I don't, I don't actually know. <laughs> <laughs> Like I've seen my dad do it, but like, right, right, right. In my mind, I'm like, oh, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I think that those kind of questions that you know to really prepare to, I really should have prepared myself more for those first few interviews. Um, you know, for those head coaching jobs of understanding the role of the head coach beyond, you know, the plays, beyond the defense, beyond the kids. You know, um really understanding, you know, how much fundraising goes into it and what you need to buy and how you need to buy it and all this other stuff. Um, it, it really has been a learning curve over the past, you know, last few years of being a head coach because that stuff I don't like. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, don't think any head coach likes doing any of that stuff. That's one of the things, right, that I don't think that the average person, whether you want to call the average person, even a parent within your program, or people who are coming to the games or whatever. I think that's one of the most underrated things about being a head coach. And I don't care what the level is. Obviously there's yeah. different types of responsibilities that you have, depending on if you're coaching at the high school level or college level or whatever, mm -hmm. but there are so many responsibilities that are outside of, Hey, it's not just, I get to go to practice and do my X's and O's and watch film. And I can just ignore all this other stuff. There's so many other things that go into building a successful program. Is there any part of it off the floor like that that I don't know if I don't know if I want to say like, but that <laughs> that you don't that you don't mind that you're kind of like, ah, no, this is kind of, this is kind of fun doing this particular thing off the floor that maybe you didn't realize before you got the head coaching job that man, I didn't realize head coaches spent a lot of time doing this. So is there any aspect of the off the court stuff that you I guess tolerate? <laughs> Um, I, you know, not any of the fundraising stuff I can tell yeah. you that. Yeah. So um, what kind of fundraising, I'm just curious, what kind of fundraising do you guys do? Oh, we do like calendar fundraisers. I, I mean, I've tried to do a bunch of different ones that like could be like a staple, like, oh, we'll do this every year. I say that every year. I'm like, this is the one we're going to do every year. Never ends up that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just like, it's one of those things where like every day there's a winner and they get this gift card. That was the one that we did last year that I really liked. Okay. Um, Because every day was a winner and I'm really big on social media and you like showing off what we do at practice, showing off, you know, what the girls are accomplishing, accomplishing like, you know, outside the basketball, like in school and stuff like right. that. So that's right. really huge to me. So being able to put that out there and have the girls, you know, have fun with it was a good time. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say I like much at, at <laughs> off the X's and O's. I like hanging out with the girls. They're yeah, such a, absolutely. you know, being around the girls, it's a fun group. And, 
you know, especially high school girls, it takes you back and you're like, oh man, was I like this in high school? And yeah, right. Of course you were. <laughs> so sure. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel that way, but it, no. it definitely it definitely is. That's one of the hardest things. I mean, again, you'll you'll figure it out as you get even older that you know, you sometimes you look back and I'll I'll watch a game or I'll, whatever, and I'll be like, man, that was that was I like that? I can't. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I was or I wasn't or you know whatever. It's just kind of interesting to think back on it yeah. from a fundraising standpoint. What do you what do you fundraise for? Like, what are some of the things that you feel like are important to? Again, I don't know if you want to call them add ons, but what are the things that you feel like fundraising helps you to do within your program? What are your goals for fundraising? You know, I like to um, make sure that our girls, you know, they put all the time, the effort, the hard work, um, time away from their families, homework, things like that. I try to give them as much things as I possibly can. So this year, um, we they each, every year they get a travel suit. Um, our varsity team gets brand new pairs of shoes every year. Um, we did a media day where we had a photographer come in and take our pictures and we did a hype video um because they've been asking me for it since i got the job nice you did tear away, you did tear away pants Brittany. i remember we seeing those on the, i know, saw those on the uh the twitter <laughs> tear away <laughs> pants are awesome like nobody yeah, they couldn't nobody... fi- they could they couldn't figure out how to use them like yeah they, no. they couldn't figure out how to oh. use them it was pretty classic it was pretty I'll have classic to send you the video because okay. it was <laughs> i told them i actually told them to practice you know ripping yeah. the pants off and they thought i was joking until you know they're getting their numbers called to you know for the starting five and they can't get their pants they can't, off. can't rip them off that's funny no. oh, that's so good well stuff. one of olivia defranco who is our all-time leading scorer at the school um really probably has every record in the book she's wanted them since like sixth grade and when i was able to and i knew we'd have the money for it i put that order in as fast as i could and then like a game later, she tears her ACL. <laughs> and it was like the saddest thing ever. Because <laughs> she's like, I've been wanting to wear these pants for pants, so long yeah. and now I'm not yeah. going to be able to. Right. Like, well, you can still wear them. <laughs> right. Exactly. You can, just, you can just run out of the house. Hey, here yeah, we go. Boom. Them. Boom. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, we got the tearaway pants this year. Um, I, I like to give them all. I gave them all um, practice shorts. They get practice jerseys. They get sweatshirts. I think I gave them like two sweatshirts this year. Um, you so so all the gear, all the gear yep. that I can buy them, I will. Um, so we did the photo shoot, the videograph, the video. Um, and so my next goal for them is we're we're trying to take that you know that big trip that all the high schoolers take um, over their winter break, you know, to all the. I think Olmstead Falls went to Arizona like two years ago. Medina went down to Orlando this past year, so. I'm trying to take that big that big trip that all the girls want to go to, you know, show off that they're in Florida for winter break. All right, can all I give the... you a, can I give you a tip for that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I got to experience this trip as a parent. So last year, my son's team went to Florida. Okay. And so what I will say is, this is my advice to you: you need to make sure that you communicate as well as humanly possible what the trip is going to cost mm-hmm. from the beginning and then don't change it a week before the trip is supposed to start. So that's my, unsol- oh my, my unsolicited, God. that's my, that's my unsolicited advice is yes. try to get it, no, try that's... to get it organized, get it organized early and communicate early and often with people how much it's going to cost and yes. how much is going to be fundraised. So uh, it was a little bit of a challenge for us. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. No, ago, it, so. it, I think we wouldn't do it. We won't do it next year, but we'll do it probably the year after. So I can get nice. So I can see all the breakdowns of everything and be like, all right, now we have a year, full year yep. of <laughs> fundraise well, for your, this. Your, your kids will have, uh, it'll be a great, it'll be a great experience for, for your players for sure. Yeah. Um, like my son had a, had a great time. Their team had, uh, you know, had a blast doing it. And uh, I, I think it's definitely something that if you do it right uh, is worth doing without question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, we've seen all these all these teams do it, and it has looked so much fun. Um, the boys basketball coach and I have been talking about it for the past couple of years, trying to get both of us to go to the same place at the same time. That would be so cool. So we can, you know, have that huge, like, 
you know, not just like a fan section, but like right. being able to support each other throughout the That's whole That's what thing. Falls did a few years ago, right? Yeah, they did that so down in Arizona. That. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, I feel like that'd we reached be great. out I feel to like them to see idea. the breakdown and everything. So it, it seems, it seems, you know, it's very expensive. Don't get me wrong. But um, hopefully we can have a few donors here and there. <laughs> yeah, abs- absolutely. All right. So you've now taken over two different programs. So you take over Bria Mid Park. And then mm-hmm. now you're at Midview. When you first get a job, what are some of the first things that you're looking at in terms of this is what I need to do in order to establish whether you want to say a winning culture, a winning program? Just what do you think about when you first take over a job? What are some of the first aspects that you're going to try to take care of? Um, you know, I want to have that 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 team meeting, that parent meeting, just to introduce myself, give them my background. Um, And I like to give as much background as I can, you know, just to show that, you know, like I've been, you know, saying that it is, I'm trying to create that family atmosphere. Um, You know, I have a small, like I, I'm just starting my family. I have a almost two year old. So having her around and being around is, you know, huge for me and just to have good people there. And then really getting down to the nitty gritty of, you know, getting the girls in the gym and seeing what we can work with and what, how we can, you know, play and, um, compete against, you know, some of the other teams that we're going to have to play and compete against. Um, you know, walking to Bria the first time, it was very overwhelming, I would say. <laughs> um, a young coach who, you know, three cities in one. And, you know, that is a monster um, for a first time head coach to walk into of trying to wrangle their youth and try to understand that and how they have all three cities and they flow into one high school. And, you know, it it is crazy. And I, you know, it's not for the week. That's for sure. Trying to, you know, get all that straightened out and figured out. Um, But, you know, just trying to, you know, understand, you know, what, what has worked with them before and what can be fixed and what can I bring to the table to help them and, you know, kind of show that mutual respect that I'm here to work as long as you're here to work. And, you know, then, you know, hit the ground running, trying to, you know, get those wins and get those um, girls to the competitive level that we need to be at. What do you think about in terms of your summer basketball program and what you put together for the girls in the off season? Maybe just walk us through what you like to do from obviously your season ends and you got a month before you can get anything cranked up, but just what do you try to accomplish in your summer basketball workouts and season? And what does that look like for you? Yeah. So funny enough, um, last summer was my first actual summer (laughs) to be able to like go through a a June um, because of COVID. I was hired late for both Berea and Midview. So I didn't have my first summer for both of those jobs. And then COVID hit at Berea. So really last summer was my first summer to actually like be a head coach during June. Um, and I, I like to try to get in the gym or open the gym as much as possible. Um, I'll, I'll go up and have the gym open for two hours this summer, um, as much as I can, uh, just to have the girls have a place to go to, to shoot and then use really maximize those 10 days of instruction to start the thinking process of how we're going to work. Um, when October 27th, comes whenever our first day of practice is that next year. So um, I like to do our summer leagues. We Last year we did a summer league with my dad over at Berea, um, which was really competitive, really good. Um, we do a middle or JV one where I have a middle schooler actually come up and play in that. So having those girls come up and play as much as possible, I think is really key. Um, we didn't do a lot of like shootouts or overnight camps last year um, just because um, I kind of wanted to, you know, have a easy breezy, cool su- summer with how crazy our ending was. Um, so this year though, I'm, I'm, I think we're going to do like an overnight camp at Finley, which has always been fun. I went there in high school and was able to do that. And so just having those team atmospheres, team things where these girls could be together for longer periods of time, just get that, um, camaraderie going and getting back together after, you know, not being with each other for, you know, a month, two months like that in the gym. 
how do you put together and develop the leaders on your team? How much of that comes through conversation in the summer? How much that comes through, again, their experience on the floor together during the season? Just how do you think about leadership on your team and developing the kind of leaders that you know it takes in order to build a winning team? You know, I I, kind of take a step back when it comes to that stuff and kind of let the girls um, figure out who those leaders are going to be, who those people are that are going to want to step up. You know, I always have my own thoughts and who's who's it going to be and who I think is our floor general and stuff like that. Um, You know, and and most of the most years it shocks me about who actually steps up and at what points and. You know, I let our girls vote on captains in the season, you know, because I'm not going to sit here and pick who you need to go to talk to if you have an issue. Um, I want you to be able to, you know, vote on those people to talk to who you're comfortable talking to. So being able to give them that kind of um, power, if you say, to be able to figure out who that person or those leaders are going to be, I think is really huge to have that respect factor back into the game. Um, and typically, you know, like this year they voted on four captains and one of those girls was like, probably wasn't going to play a lot and then live got hurt. So it was interesting that, you know, somebody that isn't one of the star players getting voted as captain, I think is really big in my eyes that, you know, some girls see that it's okay not to play all the time. It's okay not to have like this eye popping stats. Um, as long as you're a good person you know, and helping each other out in the, in practice and outside of practice. So I like to reward those girls that, you know, aren't just, you know, the stat, the stat people, but the ones that are there for the younger girls at all, you know, at all times. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it also speaks to when you let the players make those decisions, right? Is sometimes they're seeing stuff that maybe the adults don't necessarily see and they know how influential, uh, uh, you know, influential a girl could be in the locker room or maybe just in school or maybe just again with the friend groups that cross over from one, uh, you know, this group to that group and kind of bridge the gap with everybody. And clearly that that's something that you don't necessarily need to, as you said, be the best player on the floor and to be able to, in order to be able to bring those traits to, to a team. So, yeah, you know, I think that that's sometimes uh, it's sometimes underrated in terms of, yeah, sure. It's, it's great with, you know, in an ideal world, maybe you want your captain to be your hardest worker and your best practice player and your best player and your leader and all those things. But sometimes that package comes in, you know, it comes, it comes in different packages. It doesn't yeah. always come, doesn't always come in one package. Sometimes it does. And when it does, that's, that's great, but it doesn't, it doesn't always turn out to be, doesn't always turn out to be the case. Yeah. Um, in terms of style of play, and who you are as a head coach from a X's and O's philosophy standpoint. Do you feel like you have a pretty good grasp on, again, obviously year to year, it may change slightly because of your personnel and who you have. And at the high school level, you're obviously not recruiting your players. So you kind of got to play with who you have. Hey coaches, excited to talk about Coach's Mirror from Teams of Men. It's a game changer for your team's film analysis, blending Kip Ione's coaching expertise with AI. Short on time or staff, this is for you. Send in a game or up to five and get back a detailed report. We're talking tendencies, strategies, even what opponents might use against you. It's like finding the other team's scouting report in your gym. And here's a bonus. Intrigued by AI and scouting? Grab our free 10 prompt PDF sheet at teamsofmenmembership.group slash coachmirror. It's a quick download and a great start to revolutionizing your season review. Don't miss out, coaches. Head to our site and see how Coach's Mirror can transform your game analysis. Catch you there. Hey, coach. Want to take your team to the next level this season? Introducing Game Changer, the ultimate game day assistant with tools to give you a winning advantage. With Game Changer, you can track stats, keep score, and even live stream games, all for free. Get the stats and crucial game video you need to lead your team to victory, all from the palm of your hand. Coach smarter this season with Game Changer. 
Download Game Changer today on iOS or Android and make this season one to remember. Game Changer. Stream. Score. Connect. Learn more at gc.com slash hoopheads. That's gc.com slash hoopheads. When you think about who you are as a head coach, how comfortable are you at this point with, hey, I kind of know what I'm about. Not that you're not continuing to grow and evolve and learn, but just you feel like you have a pretty good handle on how you want to play. Is that a pretty accurate statement at this point? Yeah, I would say so. Um, but I, I, a lot of my coaching style comes from how I played. Um, I, when I was younger, I was like all over the place, constantly, you know, up and down, up and down, running, running, running. And if you see me coach, it's, I'm constantly moving, constantly yelling. I sw- I'm sweating just as much as the girls have the time. <laughs> I'll walk into halftime and I'll need a towel to wipe my face there off. There you go. There you go. Um, but I think, you know, being able to coach like that and the girls respond to it in such a positive way has been so fun for me just to be able to, you know, be myself and coach at the same time. Because, um, you know, not a lot of people are able to do that just because of, you know, their personality or the way they coach and, you know, how they how they want to run things. But, you know, I, I, I've been so lucky enough to have such a great group of girls over the past few years to really be able to let me come into my own and be myself as I'm learning and growing through it. How do you think about putting together your coaching staff, which I know, look, when you start talking about being at a public school and you're trying to get a varsity assistant, you need to have a JV coach, you got to have a freshman coach, and then you start talking about trying to get coaches to coach at the middle school level to be able to find enough people who are qualified and are going to be able to do the job well. What's been the process for you putting together a staff and what are some things that you're looking for in assistant coaches? Yeah, it's, it's, I've actually been really um, blessed with that because, you know, with Mac basketball. Yeah, you got a, you got a, you got a, you got a, got a farm, you got a farm, got a farm system. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, you know, I really, I haven't been able, with the girls I've coached, they're just now, you know, graduating college and finding their job. So it's, it's going to come, I think it's going to come back to that sooner than later. Um, but, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to have my JV coach who's been with me since the start, um, Bob Kaufman. He um, he knew my dad and coached with my dad when he was over at North Olmstead. And um, so having Bob on my staff since the beginning has been just so great because, you know, he's taught me so many things o- along the way as like the older voice that I needed to, you know, kind of figure out, you know, he's been under so many coaches. North Olmstead, I want to, you know, I I think he went from North Olmstead to Olmstead Falls. Um, and now Midview, I think again, because his wife was a coach over at Midview years and years ago. But just having somebody that's been seasoned and being there, you know, having that, you know, veteran um, look on things has been really wonderful for me. So that was really huge for me to have somebody like that on staff. And then and also another female voice. Um, I have Tiffany Dotson is another one of my um assistance and she played at Hiram and then was a a head coach over at Oberlin Oberlin High School for a year or two and then um she coaches AAU for us too as well so it's nice to have that you know that other woman you know kind of figure around the gym and then last year we added um Chad DeFranco which is one of my players dads but he does not he's not the typical you know dad of a player he doesn't really care if his his daughter's very good (laughs) so that helps makes it a lot easier right makes it a lot easier she's she's not she's not the 12th he's 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 a good he's a good dude he's a good dude i've coached against him many years at the middle school level so it's uh, yeah he's just they're just great people great great family so it's nice to have somebody like that and You know, he also has really been helping me organize, you know, like our concession stand and our budget that we have to turn in. So the things that I don't like to do, he'll do for me. So that's been really awesome to have. But unfortunately, he's leaving us because Olivia is moving on, uh, sadly. So I'm actually in the hunt for another assistant coach. Um, I'm hoping to, you know, get one of these younger girls that are graduated um, onto my staff this next year. But we'll see what happens. You know how how everything falls, but 
I'm excited the way things are moving in the direction of, you know, looking for that assistant coach, someone to be out there with the girls, you know, really understanding and, you know, having that basketball mindset, basketball IQ um, to push them to where we need them to be. How do you divide up the responsibilities amongst your coaches? In other words, in practice, do you have one person that's watching the offense, one person that's watching the defense? Just uh, obviously, you just talked about how Bob's taking over and doing some things off the floor. Just how do you go about <laughs> assigning roles and figuring out what everybody's going to do on your staff? Um, I kind of, you know, it just comes out kind of comes off of like personality, you know, um, and how we work together and, you know, what they like to do. I don't want to push anybody to do something that they absolutely hate. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, to, to really my job to, you know, make the final decision, but if they don't want to do it, I'm not going to force them to do it. But, you know, Chad has been kind of my right hand man the past two years and he's really helped me, um, defensively while well, I've been the offensive person for us. And then, um, you know, Bob and Tiff really work with our younger group, our JV and JV kids and, you know, get them ready to come up with us at the varsity level. And then when we go at each other, it's, um, it's fun to like practice against, you know, the JV and have those two over there and Chad and I over here and, you know, they're trying to push those JV girls to really make us make mistakes um, before we, before we scrimmage them, the girls have told me, Bob has told them all your goal is to make Brett yell. <laughs> so go. that's his goal for me. Every practice he wants me to yell or kick a ball or do something crazy. Um, just to, you know, know to make sure they're pushing our varsity kids and it's a really good cohesive, uh, thing we've got going on. So it's been nice to have them all. Nice. Yeah. To be able to have people that you can count on that, you know, are going to espouse the same things that are important to you as the head coach. Clearly that's a, a real key to being able to develop yeah. a good program. When you think about working with those, either the coaches or the players at younger levels, how do you take that as your responsibility as the varsity coach? Obviously this, this gets into the amount of time that you put in and that it takes to have a quality program and to be a really good coach. So how do you think about go, getting down, going down and getting to know those younger players, getting to know the coaches and, and working with them to make sure that as the players are coming up through your program, that they know kind of what's, what the expectation is. Yeah. I think that's a huge part of it. You know, if you don't have a good youth program, you don't have a good high school program is how I kind of look at it. Now, we just started uh, when I got to Midview, there was no youth program. Um, the youth program that there, when there was one, were these seniors now. Um, so I had to, you know, start, you know, that back up and kind of get that going. And so being able to, you know, have a hand in it and helping and, you know, being there for the tryouts and stuff like that um, and having these younger kids know who I am and see my face. And when I walk to their, over to their school and, you know, see what's going on, you know, they, they see me in the hallway and they're like, Oh, Hey coach Britt, what's up? You know, rather than like, who's that girl? Right. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, it's really important to me that these younger kids know who I am and know what I'm about and make sure they're having fun, you know, at that level first off, because if you're not having fun, then why are you there? Kind of thing. Um, because that's first and foremost, all that I want is that these kids at the younger level, younger through high school, you know, is to have that fun time because, you know, these are some of the best times of your life that you're really not going to get back. So um, as long as they're having fun, that's all that really matters to me. And then learning on top of it, you know, the fundamentals, that's really important to me. Um, at, at a typical varsity JV practice, we work on fundamentals, you know, two ball dribbling, dribbling with a um, tennis ball, uh, form shooting for 45 minutes of each of our practices, just trying to like hone in on our skills and really work and get those little things down because, you know, those little moments in games, those little things that, you know, we need to do um, are the ones that win them. So if I can get those girls at the, you know, elementary level to understand that now, when they get to that high school level, it will be easy peasy. I won't have to really tell them what they need to do. Um, and we could just start the 45 minutes of practice. Um, I'm on their, you know, typical 
uh, fundamentals. Right. Makes sense. So when you're putting together a practice, and obviously it depends on the time of the season and whether or not you're preparing for a specific opponent, (laughs) just what's your process for sitting down and putting together a practice plan? Are you sitting down with paper and pencil? Are you sitting down at the computer? How do you go about designing one of your practices? So maybe just the process for how you do it. And then do you have kind of a set way that you like to do it? Obviously, you just talked about doing that fundamental work at the beginning. So just how you put together a practice plan. Yeah, no, I I love to sit down and um, with me, I'll need to write it like 15 times for for whatever reason. (laughs) I'll I'll write it down on a paper and then I'll go on the computer and then I'll write it in the computer and then I'll have to change something. So I'll have to write it all over again and then fix it on the computer. So, and then I print it out for all my coaches to have, (laughs) even if they're like, oh, whatever. But um, no, you know, I, I love that 45 minutes of our practice, 30, 45 minutes of our practice, really working on our fundamentals, um, trying to get that ball handling and then, you know, move on to uh, we have a gun like the shooting machine gun right, at yep. our school. So we like to use that a lot um, when we're using that. We'll have the guards down there our post working out um, on the other hand. So really technically more fundamental easy little things that you, you know, you have to do. And then the last, you know, 45 minutes of our practice to a half hour um, is, you know, game planning, strategizing for, you know, who we have coming up that week. Um, a lot of times I like to, you know, watch film um, two to three times a week, whether it's on ourself or our opponent. Um, and, you know, huddle is an amazing thing. <laughs> I really, really learned to love it. It really is. Um, you know, you can, it, you can have it break down, your opponent's stats and it gives you their shot charts and, you know, their scouting reports and things like that. And, you know, the girls laugh every time I hand them the book, (laughs) they call it the book because I want to make sure they have everything they need to know on the team, um, whoever it is. Um, So, you know, really just, I I like to, you know, old fashioned way, you know, just getting, getting down to the nitty gritty, doing the little things. um, And then, you know, because if we don't do what we need to do, it doesn't matter what the other team needs to do. Right. How much film that you're watching do you end up sharing with your players? So when you say you're watching film two or three times in a week, how long are those film sessions and kind of what are you trying to focus on or show them? Are you showing things that they've done well themselves? Or are you showing things that Hey, here's some here's some mistakes we made that we got to work on and get better on. Are you showing them film of their opponent? Just how much of each of those different categories of film are you sharing with your players? Um, so probably uh, it, it depends on really the game um, that we had last. If if we go over, um, you know, our film of ourselves, you know, sometimes it's really not a great game and a and a blowout, and you really you can learn things from it, but at the same time you know, you kind of have to move on and try to, you know, do the next thing. I'll pull clips here and there of things like of our offense or, you know, we, we ran a two, three zone this past year because that was, you know, the best way we thought we could, you know, slow people down and, you know, save our legs really. So I didn't play that many girls. So understanding our two, three zone, better, I pulled our defenses off that just to show them. Um, typically our film sessions are 30 to 45 minutes long with the girls. Um, and then on the other side of it, we watch their film and I pull their offenses and defenses and they have all the information sitting in front of them. Um, and and really we go over, you know, the main points that the other team does really well. Um, their presses, their zones their mans, whatever they do on defense. And then, you know, their typical offenses that they do run. Um, so we really try to break down it as best as we can for the girls to understand, you know, what the opponent we have is, you know, what, what they're going to do. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the more information that players have, and obviously it probably changes from team to team and Mm -hmm. year to year in terms of how much film they can handle and how much they can process and different teams probably enjoy the film and get more out of it than other teams, depending upon how, that particular team processes the information. So as a coach, you kind of got to get a read and feel for your team and 
how you're, uh, you know, how you're going to put that together on game night. How do you like to get your team prepared day of the game? What are some things that you want to go over with them prior to the game, whether that's in the locker room immediately before they take the floor, just kind of talk a little bit about your sort of your game day ritual. Um, so I like to, them to get there for the, you know, the entirety of the JV game. So they're there. Um, and they're awake because sometimes on Saturdays, <laughs> yeah, of like course, to, absolutely. Know, they're asleep. Yep. Um, so, so some Saturdays we like to have like a breakfast kind of thing to make sure they're up and, you know, shoot around before the JV game. So I know they're there. Um, but then, you know, it comes down to it. I kind of let them do their thing. They get taped. You know, they watch a little bit of the game. They shoot in our ox gym, things like that. I, um, and I have been yelled at by them more than once because I send them, um, every game I send them a game day text, whether, you know, it's game day and I send a little like inspirational quote or, you know, something that I have to say. Um, and then a and then a song. So if I don't send it, then I get yelled at <laughs> because they're <laughs> all very be superstitious. Yeah, there you go. Um, I think I've I've given them my superstitious umness, whatever okay. however you say it. Uh, right, what, what's give me give me one of your superstitions? Oh, um, I always in high school I always had to wear the same socks. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was so weird. Always had to wear the same socks. Um, coaching. Um. Last year when we made our state run, this is really gross. I um did not clean my car. <laughs> All right, there you go. So like my car, whatever was in my car, if I needed to move something from it, I didn't do it. Like it w- got to the point where it was really bad, but I was like, I can't do it. I cannot clean my car. It's, funny. it's just got to stay the way it is until we go to state and that is what it is. Um, But the game day text is really one of those rituals that it's like they – I. I started the day I got the job, the game I got, the first game that we had. And then all last year we did it. So they were like, no, you have to do it every game. So I do that every game. Um, and then I tell, we go in for our um, pregame speech. And I like to tell them, pass to the girls in the whatever color jersey we're wearing. So in the white color jersey or the black color jersey. Um, that is something I got from Coach Roth Gary over at EC when I played for him. He would always tell us to pass the gr- pass the ball to the girls in the same color jerseys as you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good advice. There's some simple coaching advice that's very very, advice. very smart though. Very smart. Hey, it's all it stuck with me for all these years. So I was like, hey, it must mean something. Um, and then we pray. That is something that is really big um, with us. We um, Chad, you know, we all hold hands, slack hands in that circle, and. Um, we just say a quick prayer for, you know, being able to be here in this moment, um, be here for this game. We pray for the people that are injured and that are healing, um, that are on the court. We pray for a safe game, you know, things like that. And, you know, we get we get moving and grooving. And then we have one of the girls' um, dads who is the, we call him DJ Tommy Scrow. His <laughs> name is Tommy Scrow. Nice. But he, he likes to play some good jams for the game and he picks a, Picks our walkouts, picks the girls' walkout song. So, you know, it's a it's a great time. We like to have fun with it, but that's very no. cool. That's very cool. Yeah, you gotta have you gotta have good music. You go to some schools and you wonder like, man, like what who's <laughs> like who's picking the who's picking this music? Yeah, like, why this are you, is, why are you this, 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 is, yeah, this is this is terrible. And again, like don't get don't get me wrong. I'm yeah, I'm a fifty three year old man, so I don't expect to have the same musical taste as what's gonna hype up a 16 or 17 year old right. boy or girl. So I, I get that, but there's some that are like, man, they got to at least have some the music's got to at least have some energy. And some gyms you go yeah. in and you're like, man, there's, this is all right. And then other gyms you go in, you're like, Ooh, man, who, who picked this? Like I'd be, <laughs> be hard, be hard to get up and, and get going for this. Uh, yeah. It's like you know, for this song, class, this playlist, like some slow song playing. You're like, what is yeah. that? <laughs> it, it, hap- it happens though, way more than you think. Honestly, yes, like, I it's, agree. it's, cr- it's crazy. Uh, all right, let's talk about a topic that I know that a lot of coaches spend a lot of time on. That's parents. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about how you try to engage the parents in your program to get them to be advocates for your program as opposed to be adversarial. Yeah, I, you know, I try to um, have as 
much open communication, you know, as I possibly can. Um, my parent meeting in the beginning, you know, I give them my email, my phone number. You know, I tell them if they don't, if I don't get back to them right away, I'll get back to them within that 24 hours. Um, I kind of set really good standards of, you know, when to contact me, when not to contact me and boundaries. Um, and so I think that respect has, you know, go- gone a long way. Um, in the past, this will be my third year at Midview. Um, knock on wood. But I have not had one parent issue, one girl fighting in team fighting issue. And, you know, I really have chalked that up to the great people of Midview in that area because, you know, they, they really just understand, you know, where we're at and how we're trying to build this program um, moving forward. And, you know, they're really supportive and I really haven't had one bad, you know, parent issue. Um, but I think it's because they see that, you know, I really care for the girls. I really want them to do best, not just on the court, but off. Um, and if a parent sees that, I think, you know, if you really love and truly care for their kid, their, their person, that's their whole world. Um, they're going to give you that respect and love, um, and really be that advocate for you and your program. What do you think about in terms of communicating with parents? How much do you like, do you send out a newsletter? Are you talking to them preseason? Do you have a meeting with individual parents, a parent meeting as a whole program? Just how do you approach the communication piece? Because I think that one of the things that, that I've learned across the course of time, both from the coaching side of it and from the parent side of it, is that you tend to have a lot less challenges when the communication lines are open and the communication is positive because then if you ever do have any type of a difficult conversation that needs to be had, if you've done that proactive communication, it just helps, right? Because as you said, those parents know that you love and care for their kids. And ultimately that's the most important piece of this whole puzzle. So just how do you make sure that you're communicating with parents clearly so that they kind of have an understanding of where their child is and kind of what your program's all about? Yeah. You know, I, I have that preseason meeting with the parents, um, it, middle school through high school. So I have two separate meetings, you know, give them the guidelines and understand like, you know, I am available for you guys to talk to at any point in time. Um, if I don't answer, I don't get back to you. I will get back to you, that kind of thing. Um, but just, you know, making sure they know that I'm still learning and growing in this whole process and, you know, to give me, you know, as much grace as they can. Um, but there, I, I do give them like a step-by-step of, you know, what I, what I'd like to see, you know, if there is an issue. Um, I don't really necessarily like to talk about playing time because, you know, the, I believe that's at the dis- coach's discretion and um, it, it, playing time's earned during earned during practice. And, you know, I have open practices. So if they want to come and watch practice and see how their kid acts at practice and, you know, participates and how they're, you know, playing in practice, then they're more than welcome to. Um, we, we, you know, just want to make sure that we have all our ducks in a row, you know, trying to make sure we're, as good as possible with these parents. And, um, you know, I tell the parents if there's an issue during a game, give everybody 24 hours, myself, them, their kid, 24 hours post game to calm down, relax, because there are very high heightened emotions during any type of sporting event. So give it, give us 24 hours. And then I want their child to come to me and talk to me because When they leave high school, mom and dad aren't going to be here anymore. You know, they'll be here in your life, but mom and dad aren't going to, you know, email your professor for you or email your, your boss for you and, you know, go and be like, why are you doing, why are you paying my kid more? Um, I want the child to advocate for themselves at some point, because if they feel like they're not getting what they deserve, well, then they need to start speaking up and talking about it because when it's time for them to feel like they need a raise, you know, how are they going to learn that skill to, you know, go talk to their boss and say, Hey, I feel like I've done X, Y, and Z to get better and to have more money. 
So why am I not getting it? You know, having that conversation. And then once that conversation, if it still doesn't feel like they're resolved, then we have that parent and coach and athlete conversation to just try to clear the air and figure it out. So I think laying out those boundaries, laying out those expectations are really huge, you know, for some of these parents to understand like, oh, so there is a, you know, a pecking order, whatever you call it, to try to figure these little tiny details out. And, you know, and again, like I said, you know, showing that you really care and love for their kid, because you're right at the end of the day, that's really all that matters is they're having fun and they're loved and they're safe. Yep. That goes a long way, right? When parents know that their coach cares about their kid as more than we talked about earlier, as more than just a basketball player, that really makes a big difference. I mean, it really has a huge impact on what you do with your program and and how you put it all, how you put it all together. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you this final two part question. So part one, when you think about what you get to do every single day, what brings you the most joy? And then the second part of the question, when you look ahead over the next year or two, what do you see as being your biggest challenge? So your biggest joy and your biggest challenge. Um, Honestly, my biggest joy is being able to see these, the girls every day. Um, I work in the high school. Um, so I, I get to see more of their life than, you know, I do if I was just their coach. So being able to see there's gr- the girls and, you know, um, grow up through the years and graduate, and, you know, boyfriends and whatever. You know, it's fun to be a part of that, fun to be a part of their life in a different way than just their coach. Um, so that's really what gives me the most joy. And, you know, to have my kid, you know, grow up around such great, you know, young girls. And, you know, most of them come and babysit and <laughs> be there for, you know, Noel when, you know, she's around. And any picture you see of my team after a win, Noel's in there. So, you know, for it sure. really gives, gives that family atmosphere. And, just have such great role models and great girls. It's really like the biggest joy I could have is to have, you know, that family outside of my own family. Um, And the parents are really wonderful as well. I just have had a blast getting to know every single one of them and, you know, getting as we go on through the years. Um, And my biggest challenge, my biggest challenge will probably be, you know, kind of starting over because, you know, last year we went to the final four um, and I had a really great group of girls this year. um, We did have to start over without Olivia because she tore ACL the third game into the season. And that was, you know, all of our expectations in my head, we were going back to the districts and winning, Um, you know, and that did not happen for us this year because, you know, things change, people get hurt and you got to kind of have to move on. Um, but kind of flipping, you know, what we've done over the past two years, three years of um, how we play and how we go about them, you know, I think I'm probably going to have to play some younger kids um, these next few years just to get them ready. Um, but it'll be an exciting new challenge for me. It, 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 and even though it will be challenging, I'll be excited to go about it and do it every day um, and try to figure out a way, you know, we can win and you know, beat my dad twice a year again. There you go. That's it. Um, and hopefully one of these days we can beat Falls. <laughs> 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 that'll be, you know, that'll be the day. It's never happened at Midview for girls basketball. So that's the one team that, you know, I would like well, to. Well, I think uh, that's a lot of SWC yeah. teams' uh, goals and aspirations, right, Brittany? Yeah. That is. That is, <laughs> you know. Um, well, They it's seem to, have- to just keep coming. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to have a standard bearer, right? And yeah, so you no, have to have I love somebody- it. I love what Jordan's doing. I love what they do over there. Um, he's a great coach. He's a great person. So, you know, I love that we have that per- that that team in our conference. That's like that's the standard. You know, I hoped that was going to be us after this year, and you know, being right up there with Falls. Um, you know, but sometimes it doesn't shake out that way, and it's yeah. for the best. Yep, and I think again when you have somebody that you can measure yourself against. There's always benefit in that without question. So 100%. All right. Before we get out, Brittany, I want to give you a chance to share how people can connect with you, social media, email, website, whatever you want to share. And then I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> oh, I don't even know what my social medias are half the time. Um, well, my Twitter is Coach Britt. For Coach okay. underscore Coach Britt underscore. There, there I just go. didn't know what the underscores were. Um, underscore Coach Britt underscore. And then our Midview um, account is Lady Midi Hoops. So you can find us, you know, find me both there. Um, you know, I tweet about all my girls all the time, whether it's AAU or, you know, Midview. Um, and then at Mac Basketball, whatever his one is. There you we're go. Always, we're always all over, all over there, but we like to have a good time. That's for that's sure. What, that's what it's all about. Brittany, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule tonight to jump on and join yeah, of us. of course. Thanks for having really, me. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Uh, and to everyone out there, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies. And most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoop heads to learn more. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.